Coming up on Backyard Farmer, we'll get some tips on watering your home landscape and decide whether to mow in May or not. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we've got another great show planned for you tonight. We'd also love to hear from you. If you have a gardening question, just give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. You can also get in touch with us via email. That address is byf at unl.edu. Those emailed questions and pictures will be answered on a future show. So please do tell us where you live, give us as much information as you can, and do keep in mind that emailed questions cannot all be answered on the air. I'd also like to invite you to check out the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. We have past features and shows as well as you can join our Facebook community. So, Kate, welcome this year. Yes, thank you. With the very Today's first sample. tiny sample. <laughs> yes, and it comes courtesy <clears throat> from fellow farmer Jody Green's house. Uh -oh. So these are clover mites, and they are very, very small. You're going to have to extra zoom in to see them. But a lot of people are calling about these because this time of year, the mites are leaving their host plant of turf grass and weeds, and they are making their way inside people's houses. Um, fortunately, they don't bite. They don't um, hurt your house. But unfortunately, there's no one good thing you do to completely control them. Um, however, you can hope that there are different things that might give you some relief. Um, our first recommendation is always just move that vegetation away from the house. You want one to two foot band of something that's just river rock, no turf, no plants. That's pretty difficult for people to do. You could also spray turf with the appropriate insecticide, but you wanna get about 10 feet from the house outward. Um, you can spray cracks and, cracks and crevices. You can put these sticky traps down indoors. Um, but most of all, you might just have to get used to living with them because there's a lot of people that, despite doing all that, still suffer from clover mites. Um, and lastly, just to end on, um, we do see higher populations of the mites in lawns that are underwatered and over fertilized. So just something to keep in mind if you have a history of issues with these. Perfect, and I'm glad our, uh, you said that, and I'll bet our turf guy was kind of happy to hear that too. That was an outstanding answer. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you have an outstanding, lovely, blooming thing, Rock. R right. And so if anyone doesn't know what I'm holding in my hands, maybe you should watch something else and not garden because this is the common dandelion. <laughs> and the reason we're showing it to you, because I think most people that watch the show can identify it, is that the optimal time to spray dandelion is in the fall. But we still have questions frequently about if I want to eradicate it, what do I do? And people tend to spray dandelion in the spring way too early. Um, and they do that and the plant is spending a lot of energy into trying to produce seed heads and the flower and everything else. And it really isn't going to uptake the herbicide very well. But the intriguing thing is, is once this seed head, oh, there we go. Once the seed head produces the puff ball, at that point in time, that plant is energy is really depleted, and that's the optimal time in the spring is when we it's in the, what we call the puffball stage. And the beauty of that is for those people that think, unfortunately, believe that this is a great pollinator food source, it's actually kind of marginal and very um, low in nutritional value, but at least you're not spraying it while it's producing the flower and while it's producing the pollen. So it's the best of both worlds. You get great control, maybe not any forage pollen for the next year, but at least you're allowing that for this one year. And all you have to do is walk around a town and see how many dandelions there are. But at the end of the day, in the puffball stage, in the spring is best. Still better in the fall, but puffball stage, spray it with any of the commonly labeled, including the organics like Fiesta, and you'll get far better control. Excellent, thank you, Rock. All right, Kyle, would you find that's a rod or a spot this time? It's kind of neither. Um, it's <laughs> ex uh, So it's a virus. Um, and oh. so I have a, a peony that came into the diagnostic clinic with peony ring spot virus. So let's see if we can, there we go. But um, so peony ring spot virus is what it what used to be known as, but once we did a little bit more, more work on it, turns out it's one of our old friends, tobacco rattle virus. So tobacco rattle virus has a very broad host range. Um, it's, it can affect over 400 different species of plants. 
that, that are in something like 50 different families. And it's actually spread via a microscopic worm in the soil by a nematode. Um, as far as what to do about it, really there is nothing that, that can be done. I know that we had some peonies on campus that had had this a few years ago, and I think that Jeff had to pull, yep. pull them out. Right, yep, we removed them, right. Yep, so, so as with, with a lot of our virus issues, again, there's no really no treatment. Um, it's a vet virus that is primarily spread by nematodes, but we also can spread it ourselves via pruning. And so if you are seeing any kind of weird, strange spots or kind of mosaic-y patterns on, on your leaves, that's just a good, a good reminder to make sure that you are cleaning your pruning equipment when moving from plant to plant because we spread a lot of diseases inadvertent, in, in, inadvertently. inadvertently. <laughs> Not, <laughs> Not on, on purpose. purpose. Not on purpose. <laughs> that would have saved me a lot of, a lot of time. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Jeff, what did you bring? <laughs> okay, I brought these on purpose. So. <laughs> So I brought a couple things. Um, I have uh, Mount Morrissey cherry, so it's kind of a common old-fashioned sour cherry. Uh, we, I have a hazelnut, and then I have a Turkish hazel, purple Turkish hazel here. So the, the point of this is we are really having a nice spring, and you can see the, the plants, the trees in particular, are flowering great right now. The crab apples and red buds, kind of all the common ones, the viburnums are starting. So if you're a... Uh, fruit or nut person like I am, this is the time we may have a really good harvest this year. So mm -hmm. the way the weather forecast is looking right now for the month of May. So a lot of times we'll get some questions about what do we do about creatures that are eating my fruit. And this might be the time now to, if you need to put up something to prevent them from getting to those plants, this may be the time to do it. Really so kind of plan ahead. Exactly, and our Montmorency uh, in the backyard farmer garden is in full flower right now too. Yeah. So. Yeah, cool. it's a really good year for it. All right, thanks all. All right, Kate, you get the first set of uh, picture questions. Um, we don't know where this particular viewer is, but he has um, asparagus, 10 years old. Is it going to die? What is it lacking? And then there's an additional question with that from somebody else from Blue Springs who said, is there anything she can spray to get common asparagus beetles off the spray? Beers. So I don't know whether this is that damage or... Yeah, so when we see kind of like the curling at the top, that cane shape on the asparagus, it's pretty indicative of asparagus beetle damage. Um, as we get into May, April, May is a really good time just to monitor and scout for the beetles, pull the adults off, you know, crush the eggs. And fall cleanup is really important with asparagus beetles too, because the adults will overwinter in that, um, in the leaf litter and anything else really down there. So cleaning up is important. As far as um, pesticides, there's a lot of different options out there. There's um, pyrethrins, permethrins, um, neem, spinosad, all sorts of different products. But as you choose one, just make sure that it's labeled for asparagus. Um, read the label to, so you know how often it needs to be reapplied. Some is two days, some is two weeks. And then pay really close attention to that pre-harvest interval. And that's the time from when you spray to when you can harvest it. All right, thank you, Kate. You have three pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. They have a red oak. It was an inch and a half diameter in 2010. Now it's got some holes in the trunk and it's got something that uh, have sort of a thistle like seed inside once it's broken open. So you can see the holes and then I think we have pictures of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of that. Yeah, so the holes in the trunk could possibly be an oak tree borer. We'd need a little bit closer look at the holes to be sure. Um, those type of borers generally attack trees that are already stressed or damaged from something else. But the third picture of that brown little ball is actually an old oak tree apple gall. So when they're fresh, they're green, but as they get older and the, the wasp leaves, because these are caused by little tiny cynipid wasps that lay eggs on a bud, um, as the wasp leaves, you'll see that exit hole, they turn brown. Um, the good news with a lot of tree galls and a lot of scenarios is that the galls are just not pleasant to look at for most people, but they don't um, harm the overall health of the tree. If it, come, if it becomes a bigger issue later on, you can always prune them out, but right now you don't need to do anything. All right, thank you, Kate. All right, Rock, uh, you have a couple that are tree related. 
This is a uh, large oak removed. The stump was ground out, huge mound of mulch. They're wondering when and how to replant grass in that so it doesn't keep sinking and refilling and sinking and refilling, et cetera. So, so there's a couple of things. That's a great question, though. A couple of things. Number one, there's a lot of organic, you know, wood debris in there, and so planting grass over that location again. Um, I mean, if they wanted to plant another tree, certainly they would have to do some things. But I think if they're planning on replacing the tree, certainly that would be more advisable than trying to put turf in that hole because that's going to produce um, fairy rings, and it's you know you're going to have to dump a ton of nitrogen on it to break that high carbon material down. So I actually would recommend, contrary to what people think, it's not all turf all the time, <laughs> I, I would replace the tree and maybe when, when Jeff gets a chance, he could describe what you would do to put a tree back in that same location because it looked like it was probably a pretty healthy tree and did a great job shading the house. All right, you have three pictures on this next one. This is a Northwest Omaha viewer. They back up to NRD, uh, Far Edges is a drainage. They started tilling. Then they learned from us that they had stirred up all the weed seeds. Uh, this year there is something there that's just beginning to flower. They want to know what it is and how to deal with it. Yeah, that's pennycress, and pennycress is a prolific seed producer, so I would get in there and start hacking that down. It doesn't have a great, it's an annual, it's a winter annual in primarily in Nebraska, so it's gonna head out really hard here in a little bit. Get that knocked down as much as you can, um, either hoe or mow or whatever the case may be. And then if they're planning on planting in there, um, you know, since this is a winter annual, we would suggest a pre-emergent of some kind, and there are organic and inorganic options that they can use, synthetic options that they can use next fall to make sure they can come back. Because that's, that's a pretty healthy stand of pennygrass. Okay, all right, and you have two pictures on this next one, Rock. Uh, this is also a Lincoln viewer. They overseeded, and then he's saying this crabgrass-looking weed showed up in abundance, kind of looks like crabgrass. Spraying will kill almost anything. Can't find anything else in the lawn. So what do we think that one is? So new seeding, and I'm not sure where they got their seed, and I'm not saying it came from the seed, but this looks like rough bluegrass, Poa trivialis, which has been isolated as a contaminant in bluegrass seed as well as turf type tall fescue seed. And my sense is based on that coloration and the lighter yellow color and its more aggressive growth this spring, that that's probably a rough bluegrass and they either have to live with it or start over. Okay, and Kyle, do you wanna weigh in on this? Cause they're thinking maybe this one might have had something to do with you as well. Yeah, um, I know it's, I was kind of stumped by it because we're kind of too early for a lot of our, a lot of our turf diseases right now. Um, you know, the size of the spots kind of looked a little, a little bit like dollar spot or, or, um, or summer patch, but we're too early for any of that. There are quite a few, um, there are quite a few uh, fungi that will show up in the same spot year after year. And so summer patch is certainly one of those. And so if summer patch is a disease that you've dealt with historically, um, typically it shows up a little bit later in the summer, but you may still have some of those dead spots. Um, you want to wait to what you want to wait until the turf has been is the, until the soil is at, at at least 65 degrees um, for about five days straight before you would do any sort of fungicide application. So right now we're really too early for any sort of fungicide control for any um, for a lot of our turf diseases, at least in a in a homeowner situation. All right, and Kyle, you have two more pictures, and this is uh, what type of plants are these, and what's causing the brown black areas on them? They've had some frost lately. It looks like flowers didn't survive the cold. The type of plant they are is a green shrubby one that has kind of shiny <laughs> leaves. I, I like to identify diseases and not necessarily plants. And so hopefully somebody else here can, uh, can help out with that. Um, but the, as far as what's going on with the leaves, I think it's really just kind of cold damage. Um, so it was the, um, we had, the, especially when you, the drought that we've had, um, then in addition to a little bit of colder temperatures, the, um, things greened up pretty quickly and then it got cold again. Um, once they, they, plants weren't ready to get cold again and we're kind of seeing the, the damage right there. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, Jeff, you have three pictures on this first one. Okay. This is a Valparaiso viewer who uh, discovered two strips of bark missing from a 50-year-old Austrian pine. In the windbreak, they suspect a lightning strike. What are the tree's chances of survival and what measures should they take? So I think we have a third one that shows that hitting the ground. 
You know, it's hard to say. I would agree. It does look like a lightning strike to me. I, um, if that tree is not in danger of hitting a structure, a home, or a sidewalk, or a driveway, or street, you can wait and see what happens with it. Um, it'll either start showing dieback fairly soon, and that'll tell you that it was killed by the lightning, or we've had we had this happen on campus, and you'll start seeing new callus wood come in and slowly seal that up. So. It's, it's too early to say. All right, thank you. And you have two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is a uh, viewer outside of Lincoln. They have uh, an Ammer maple that was about 15 years old, died. They have nine other ones right next to it that seem fine. They wanna know what caused the one to die and what can they do to keep the others alive? Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know what caused the one to die. You know. Um, I think some of the issues that we've had certainly recently is our inconsistent moisture uh, and heat in our weather. So I think anything you can do to make sure that you have um, consistent moisture available to the trees, mulching the trees, um, and protecting them that way will extend their life. That's just kind of your best options. All right, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> well, you know, we've been getting a little moisture lately. That is always a good sign that our plants are getting maybe some of the water they need. How much is enough? How much is too much or not enough? Let's get some watering tips from Jeff. In Nebraska, there may not be anything more important to us as gardeners as water. Water is critical for us to be able to do what we want to do in our yards, to have the beautiful landscapes, the lawns, to grow the vegetables, the apple trees, any of those things are all going to require water. So one of the things that we want to do going into spring, a common question on, on Backyard Farmer is how much water should I give my lawn? How, much, how long should I water my tree? How long should I water this plant or that plant? And, and you know, really the answer is it depends. There's a couple general rules though you want to look at. First of all, that uh, you want to make sure that for your lawns that the soil is moist, not wet, but moist down to about eight inches. And if you have trees and shrubs, relatively newly planted trees and shrubs, you're going to look at maybe 12 inches deep for soil that is moist. How long you water will depend on the type of soil that you have. So if it's sandy soil, it may not take as long, but you'll have to add water more frequently. If it's a clay soil, you may have to water longer, but you could do it less frequently. So that's, that's why sometimes it's difficult for us to answer that question about how much water should I give a tree? How long should I water this? How long should I water that? I think it's important um, to use a few simple tools. So I have this long screwdriver, or you could use something metal, something long that you can put in the ground to help kind of guide you and let you know what the soil is like. And then you're gonna have to look at your landscape and do some experimenting and figure out what parts of your lawn requires more water more frequently than other parts. Um, and you'll then have to come up with your own routine for your yard. So it's, there's not really a simple answer to the question of how long should I water, how much water should something have. I think it's important to keep in mind that again, that water is a critical resource for us, for all of us, and that it's important not to waste our water. It's important to use it smartly so that we give the plants what they need to thrive, but at the same time we're not wasting water and overusing it and in the long run causing problems. Some simple things you can use to kind of indicate uh, that water uh, is needed for a plant is if trees or shrubs are wilting, uh, it may need water, but many times that's also an indication of overwatering. So keep that in mind that before you, if you know you've watered something recently, you may check it again before you add more water. Again, if we've had rainfall, uh, it may already be at a point where it's saturated. So, look at your landscape, do some checking, do some investigation, see what your soils are like, and then carefully use that precious resource water in your landscape. Conservation is extremely important. Not only that, understanding that plant's water needs will really help you keep all those plants thriving 
help you save water. And nobody really likes to water more than they have to anyway. It's too much work. <laughs> All right, Kate, first question here is this is from a Valparaiso viewer. She has three shrubs in front of the house that are covered in what like look like tiny white mm -hmm. bugs. They're essentially killing them. The leaves are all yellow and shrivels and there's some bare branches. I can empathize with this one. My burning bushes have them. Uh -huh. um, these are euonymus, did I say that right? Euonymus scales. Mm -hmm. um, a pretty hefty case of euonymus scales. Um, one thing you can do is you can trim out areas where there's a lot of them. Um, you the thing with scales is you have to wait until the crawler stage, so it takes a lot of monitoring, and that's really the only time you could spray something like a horticultural oil. Um, you could do a systemic, but in this case, with kind of how severe it looks, I would probably cut my losses and maybe start from scratch. Are, is it early for you on the scales that heavy? It seems like it it's It seems early. like it's been a, going on for a while, All to right. me anyways. Yeah. All right, thanks, Kate. You have another uh, picture. This is always a fun one. Uh, this is a Lincoln viewer. What is making these marks along the foundation? Insect or rodent? The dirt is very fine and first noticed it last summer. So do they need to be concerned this year? Well, it's an insect um, and it's a really cool insect. These are called antlions. And the larva of the antlion, there's one that sits at the bottom of each pit and we call the larva doodle bugs, which is nice because we're usually really, um, you know, entomologists are not creative. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> antlions, the good news is they don't hurt the lawn, they won't hurt you, they won't hurt the home. Instead, they're predatory, so they're waiting for ants to come and fall into the pits. They'll even throw some sand or dirt at them to help that fall, and then they have a nice meal. So if you don't like ants, you can consider these friends. And, and I know last year when we had this, we thought about that thing on Star Wars. Oh, right. oh, it comes yes. up and mm -hmm. whatever the thing is, the thing. The Sarlacc? No. <laughs> Something oh, like that. Right that's name. not the right name. <laughs> now we're going to call in and be mad about <laughs> not knowing the right name. We'll have to post it. Yep. <laughs> All right, Rock, now we have the crabgrass uh, and overseed question. They, they think this uh, crabgrass looking grass showed up in abundance, called it, it was called a bad fescue, looks like crabgrass. Only solution was Roundup to spray all of it. Is there anything that's an alternative? For, for control of for that? Control of whatever this is. I, I'm convinced now, and I think I incorrectly looked at the other picture, sorry, but um, this one is, uh, I think that's rough bluegrass as a, con I'm gonna guess as a contaminant or it was resident in the soil when they got it ready to seed. Um, there's no way to definitively prove whether it was in the seed or not, but if they overseeded, we often see this in new seedings. Um, Poa trivialis or rough bluegrass doesn't do well in the sun, um, so it eventually will be choked out in the sun, but if they have heavy shade, it will actually dominate those, and it's always gonna be the first to start initiating growth, grow more rapidly than bluegrass or fescue, and then its growth will slow down when in the heat of the summer. So it's something they could live with, and we see a lot of lawns all across eastern Nebraska that have rough bluegrass as a contaminant, and there is no selective control. All right, thank you, Rock. And you have uh, two pictures on this next one. This is Western Oto County. This is an area that got seeded last fall. They seem to have this sporadically growing. They think it's a dwarf broom, or brome, I'm sorry. And they wonder, is there a specific herbicide that they can use to rid the lawn of this? I'm pretty confident this is downy brome, which is a winter annual, very common throughout this region. Um, there are dwarf bromes, but they're ornamentals and they're perennial, and I would find it hard to believe that there's, that's, it's, it's actually the true dwarf brome. Um, downy brome is a winter annual, so once again, it's going to be controlled in the fall of the year because it germinates in the fall, so any of your commonly available pre-emergent herbicides will work, including corn gluten mill if you want to go the organic route. All right, thanks, Rock. Kyle, this is a Lincoln viewer, a uh, beautiful peach tree that is in need of emergency care. Um, it got trimmed by a power company. Limbs started drying out immediately and began to crack. This year it cracked further and then we have some tiny little white mushrooms sprouting. Can it be saved? And yes, it's yours because there are shrooms and yes, it's Jeff's because we know the answer. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> and unfortunately I think that you do as well. It's <laughs> Not much to do about with this tree right now, aside from planning a replacement. Um, the 
with this picture, it's really can't really identify what exactly those um, what exactly those mushrooms are. They do look like they're um, they're a tooth mushroom, and so maybe something in the Cyrax um, in the Cyrax genus. But um, regardless, it is a heartwood rot that's that's um, occurring on that tree, and it's just going to continue. And eventually, this tree will will fall down. Whether you help it fall down earlier or whether it fall down, falls on its own is up to you. And that was kind of a terrible pruning cut. Mm. Yeah, all right. So two more pictures for you, Kyle. Uh, this can, comes to us from Omaha late last year. She, f she f found this weird thing and first off, she, pinkish mass, smelly, and then whatever that white fuzzy stuff was. Yeah, so the, well, on the first picture, um, that was where rhizomorphs, and so basically thicker mycelia that we see with a lot of, with a lot of mushrooms. And this is a stinkhorn egg, and so that, that egg will eventually pop up into a, into a stinkhorn um, kind of later in the summer. I do know some pathologists who have mistaken stinkhorn eggs for snake eggs as well, but no, this is a stinkhorn. So. All right, so, and we didn't have many of those last year. Nope. Okay, Jeff, um, let's see, you have two pictures on this first one. At first glance, they thought a squirrel or a rabbit had died and mummified at the base of this tree. Okay. I think your second, yep, there it is. Uh, oh. They've lived here for 40 years. The tree was already there, so the tree is probably 75 years old. They're wondering, is this harmful to the tree? Well, it's a, it's a root, so and as old as the tree is, big as it is, um, you know, we call this a stem girdling root. Uh, I think it's worth contacting an arborist to come in and look at it, and if anything, maybe see if it makes sense to remove that. All right. Carefully. Two pictures on this next one. This is a uh, quaking aspen, started from seed three years ago. Uh, his child decided to remove nearly all the leaves. Okay. He's wondering, is there anything we can do to make it survive? Spank the child, and then, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I think it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, it'll, it'll come back from it, so you'll be all right. Okay, and then you have one more picture, and this is a Lincoln viewer. Uh, she has a honeysuckle vine. Mm. She's been growing for three years. It was variegated. Now she has a non-variegated shoot. What yeah. should she do? I would just follow that back and, and prune that out, and you'll just have to keep doing that. They'll, they'll want to revert. Once they revert. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jeff. Well, with the benefit of a little rain, our garden is showing some signs of color. Terry James says it's still awfully early to start planting, but let's take a few minutes to see what's new at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are relishing in a little bit of rain. We got about an inch of rain here in Lincoln last week, and we were so happy to have that. It's really helped kind of push these spring flowers up and we're seeing some great color starting in the backyard farmer garden. In our greenhouse, we still have all of our stuff kind of sitting in there waiting to come out and start hardening off because, you know, it's still getting pretty cool in those evenings and we really can't pull them back in and out like most people can. So if you're getting ready for your garden, make sure that you are hardening those things off. Pull them back in if it's too cool in the evening and start thinking about some of those containers because you're gonna have to pull those spring flowers out like those pansies like we have in here. And you're gonna have to start thinking about how you're gonna design those summer containers. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. It's always fun to see what pops out of the ground this time of year as we wait to get started with the real planting. Should be able to do that in a few weeks. You and but right now it is time for the lightning round. Jeff, ready? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a Rembrandt, Iowa viewer who has a beautiful big apricot tree, a big one. Okay. Needs to know when to prune it. Well, let's prune it after we're done. Prune it in the fall. Prune yeah. it in the fall. All right, we have a Minden viewer who wants to know how to control grass and weeds in her asparagus. I think I would, you know, I would do it by hand. I would hand pull the weeds. I don't think I want to apply any um, herbicides in my All right. Asparagus. We have a Pierce viewer who wants to know how to control brome in an iris. 
I think the same thing. Again, I don't want to get any herbicides on the, on the iris. All right. So we have a Bellevue viewer who needs to replace an old silver maple with a new tree. He's wondering if the new elms are very good disease-wise. We've had good luck with the elms. So, yeah, they, you need to watch the pruning on them, though. That's the whole thing as they mature. All right. A uh, viewer usually had 80 or 90 tulip blooms and has only had 10 this year. Why? Maybe the age of the tulips. So we may need to renew the tulips. All right. Very nice job. You ready, Kyle? He's born ready. <laughs> okay. And it was Sarlacc. You were right. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. That should be a point, right? Yeah, no. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, this is a Lincoln viewer who, uh, who says they have a smoke tree that gets rust on the leaves every sing uh, midsummer for the last three years. Is there any treatment right now that they can do? Um, you could apply something like chlorothalonil, but realistically it's not harming the long-term life of the tree. All right, um, this is a Carney viewer who says they can't really change their soil in a narrow raised planter bed. Can they add something to the soil to keep it from getting any of your rots and spots? Um, I would just add some, I guess, or organic mulch and mix that in and increase the biodiversity in, in there. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who has some sort of a fungal spot on ornamental sweet potato plants. Should they treat it? No. <laughs> We have a viewer who wants to know uh, whether the dead branches on Colorado blue spruce should be treated or cut off. This is a Sprague viewer. Uh, cut them out. They, they, won't re, re, they will not re-green. All right. We have a uh, viewer who wants to know whether cow manure used to fertilize a garden will spread E. coli and get into the produce. It certainly can. Um, so yeah, be careful of that. All right. Nice job. Okay, Rock, you ready? I wasn't born ready, but apparently my pathologist friend was. <laughs> <laughs> you just became ready. All right, uh, your first one comes to us from Fremont. This viewer wants to know whether lawn tractor sprinklers put down enough water on the lawn. Uh, certainly they have some speed control on them. Most of them do. Um, so you could probably make them if you don't think it is. But after you get done, that great pointer that uh, Jeff showed out earlier with the screwdriver, see how deep the water went? All right, perfect. Uh, this is a neighbor who killed all of the turf and weeds in their yard literally overnight on purpose. And the uh, other neighbors want to know what this neighbor used. I have no idea, but that's pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is an Ainsworth viewer who overseeded, and they're wondering how to actually mow the older sparse turf without hurting the new upcoming turf. Actually, new turf is fairly resilient, plus it's protected because it's not as tall as the existing turf. So, you know, you could go over it and if you think you're actually pulling it up, then certainly quit. But for the most part, when we overseed a lawn, you can get on it with a mower as soon as it needs to be mowed. All right. A viewer in Lincoln wants to know what is the safest pre or post herbicide for dandelions in particular? Uh, for pre, um, I'll go ahead and answer this. For the pre-emergent, there really is no pre-emergent control. Uh, for dandelion, that's very effective. You get 20 to 30 percent, even with the pentamethylene or barricade, or excuse me, probiotic based products. But on the other end of the spectrum, certainly there are a number of broadleaf herbicides. Usually, the three may mixes um, that are combination products work the best on dandelion as a post emergent. All right, thank you very much. Okay, Kate, you ready? Of course. This is a South Sioux City viewer who once knows that earthworms are hard to control, but wants to control them because they have moles who eat the earthworms. What works? Um, there used to be a product, I think it was called Early Bird or something like that, but to my knowledge, there's nothing that I can think of that's available right now. All right, this is a Henderson viewer who wants to know, is there a best choice product to use to manage spider mites on landscape plants? Um, best choice, you can try an insecticidal soap or neem oil, but you should really get that hose out first and foremost. All right. This is an Omaha viewer who wants to know, is there a safe insecticide to use along a chain link fence to protect from insects that are attracted to their neighbor's chickens? I would be curious. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking flies? I don't know. Usually with flies, there's nothing that you can really do. It. All right. Sorry. Uh, this is a, a viewer who has roly-polies, thousands of them, inundating the landscape beds. What to do? 
Um, I don't believe anything's labeled for roly polies. I would just let them be. They're not really causing any harm. All right, nice job, all. It looks like we had a tie between you two. Okay, so you have to share. And Jeff, we have beautiful, beautiful yeah, plants we of the week. We, we were born ready. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. <Yes>. Stop. <laughs> Thinking, well, what's also ready is our beautiful flowers we have tonight. So we have um, the lilac we see is Pocahontas lilac. And like most of the lilacs right now, as I was talking earlier, are just really putting on a show. So this is a, a good year for our flowering trees and shrubs. And then we have choke cherry is our other, our white flowering plant here. And again, so edible. Eat. I've eaten a lot of choke cherry. That's one of those I'll go back to and eat again. Mm -hmm. So, but it's also one that uh, can be popular with the birds and the squirrels and some of those. So again, if it's something you want to think about protecting, um, so. All right. But anyway, beautiful Thank plants. Thank you very much, Jeff. All it right. Smells really good too. Yeah, that's me. The hell. <laughs> <laughs> or the lilacs. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let's see, Kate, you have two pictures on this one. This is Western Oto County also. Uh, they're, they're calling these two things uh, fur babies. Aww. And they're wondering what they are. The wings appear to be wet and no stinger, but a little wedge shape. They're wondering what he is and is he a good guy? Yeah, it is a good guy. This is a really cool find also. This is a snowberry clear wing or sphinx moth. They're one of our day flying moths, so you'll see them visiting flowers, possibly providing some pollination. Definitely friend, and as you can tell by the color and the fuzziness, they mimic bumblebees. Lovely. All right, you have three picks on this next one. Uh, this is a viewer who, who is just outside Sioux City, doesn't think it's an EAB problem, but he's thinking it's probably an ash borer. Is it an issue for ash trees, and is it bad to try to move these as well, the firewood? Yeah, so it is an ash borer, not the emerald. It's called a banded ash borer. Um, and it's one of those longhorn beetles that bore into trees. And as I um, kind of mentioned, those longhorn beetles tend to attack trees that are already stressed or damaged. Um, if you're worried about the firewood, just keep it outside as the adults emerge. And if you needed to treat an ash tree, um, you would need to treat before the eggs are laid. And since we're already seeing adults, it'd probably be a little late for that. Um, but really, you don't need to do too much. All right, thank you, Kate. Rock, you have um, a, one picture from Thedford and two pictures uh, from Lincoln, both of which have to do with trees. The Thedford one first here is drought, all sorts of exposed roots. He wants to know if he can bring in topsoil, spread it over, and then plant turf. And your second two are a mature tree from Lincoln that uh, has large exposed roots, make it difficult to mow. They, you know, they hit them with the blades. Can they trim the roots flush with the ground and then go ahead and plant grass? There's about five no's in the answer to that, all right? <laughs> let's, let's start with bearing roots that are exposed at the surface. Uh, trees normally do that, and unless there was been some excavation and soil removal, then um, there's no reason to pack it back on. Um, we tr try to avoid planting turf right next to a tree for a number of different reasons. They're hard to mow, and the turf just doesn't really do well in that heavy shade, even with a tree that's got tall limbs on it, right? So you throw that into the equation, and you, you certainly don't want to be bearing roots. And for the most part, those trees will then put the roots up back to the surface anyway, because that's what they do. That's their um, genetics and and just don't if you don't have to mow under there then you certainly aren't going to scar up the roots consider an organic mulch you know um, shredded bark I mean there's a number of them on the market and landfills often have them for almost little or no cost and I know that's a large area but it really shouldn't be turf under there all right thank you rock Kyle uh, we have three shroom pictures that got sent to us from Houston and they're growing in one of two raised beds one bed has been able to produce veggies and flowers. The bed with the shrooms has not. Well, I don't know why it's not producing veggies and flowers, but it's not the, not, not the mushroom's fault. And so these are, <laughs> it's, it's never the mushroom's fault. Um, but these are stinkhorns. Um, and so some, but the, this is kind of the more mature variety of what we're seeing. And there are a lot of different types of stinkhorns that, that we have out there, but the, the gooey, slimy, black, spot on there, um, mess in there. That, those are all the spores and they stink, attracts flies, get the spores on them and they, they fly away. But 
not, those are not the reason why it's not producing. And are all three of these pictures stinkhorns? Uh, yeah, they are. I'm pretty, yep, it's just at different stages of development. All right, then you have a viewer also. This is, uh, he sent us a picture of a, uh, a Manib fungicide that he has been using for years, but he can't find it. He's wondering what he should use as a fungicide instead, or can he find this in some other, he wants to buy it locally. This is Norfolk. It's yeah, yeah. So you can you can get it via the mail, um, but the big question whenever you want to apply any sort of fungicide or really any, any chemical is what are you trying to control and what are you going to spray it on? And without knowing those two questions, it's really hard to give a to give a good answer. But something like something like Dacanil would probably be a decent replacement. All right, thank you, Kyle. Two pictures on this first one for you, Jeff. Uh, this is Northwest Omaha. Uh, why are the ewes turning brown? They're on the west side of the house in full sun. Just started turning brown recently. And then you have a third picture that is also ewes. And it's, he's wondering, is the browning of the new growth a lack of water? I think probably in both cases, a lack of water may be the answer. So, um, and I, you know, again, we'd want to check and make sure we haven't watered those, overwatered those areas as well. So that's the other issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, uh, you know, with you, you're not gonna, you're gonna want to stop any pruning in the late summer. You're not gonna want to prune into the fall. And, and the one that's hedged there is done very neatly. So I would be concerned that it was pruned a bit late. All right. Yeah. All right, thanks, Jeff. You have two pictures on this next one. This is a U10 viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Vanderwolf pine, uh, seven years old. He's got lots of them, but this one looks like this coming out of winter. And I think that's just some, some cold damage, some winter damage. So again, make sure that we have some mulch and, and that it's being watered properly and don't overwater it and it should come out of it fine. All right, thanks, Jeff. Well, you know, we've covered mowing heights more than once on this show. But sometimes something called No Mow May has been in the headlines lately. And as you might expect, Rock has something to say about that. Recent media blasts on the idea of No Mow May have been prevalent on various sources. Want to talk a little bit about No Mow May, what its roots are, where it came from, and why while some of it may be valid, some of it is really gonna be catastrophic to a healthy lawn. No mow May is something that's been done in Europe for years. In, in Europe, they often say, hey, the month of May when a lot of our species, because the lawns in Europe tend to be a little weedier than the ideal lawn in, in America, and they have some plants that can be used by pollinators. So certainly by limiting the number of mowings in May, the Europeans then turn around and can help with pollinator health, especially in the spring of the year. That got moved to the United States, and with some adjustments, it's actually a pretty good idea. But it's not no mow May. We know that we can, if we raise our mowing height, per the recommendation we've made on this show for literally decades, we raise our mowing height, the frequency for mowing is decreased. So if you mow at two inches, you're mowing every week during peak growing season. You mow at two and a half inches, maybe every seven, eight days. But if you mow at three and a half to four inches, which is usually the maximum height on your mower, do you know that you could probably mow every 10 to 18 days? And when you delay mowings between 10 and 18 days and have species that can help the pollinators in it and they flower below that mowing height, they're gonna add to that beneficial environment. If you're one of these people that doesn't need the picture-perfect lawn, what you can do is consider allowing clover um, to, to be introduced into the lawn or to actually let not control those weeds and let that lawn grow up. And if that lawn grows up, that clover should flower. And when it flowers, that's a great source for pollinators. Now, maybe some people don't like those weeds and they would prefer to plant ornamentals that attract pollinators elsewhere in the landscape, which is certainly another option. But don't be led to believe that no mow may means not mowing at all. You're still gonna need to mow because not mowing a lawn can be catastrophic in the long run, especially when we get into the summer months when water is limited and heat is accelerated. And if we scalp the lawn, so we don't mow for the entire month of May, and then we scalp it down to our desired mowing height, then hopefully you're at three and a half inches to four inches, you still are going to shock that lawn 
You know, you're going to take away all that photosynthetic machinery in the leaves, and the plant is going to respond by turning brown and looking really ragged for a while. And it's entirely possible that that lawn is going to go into the summer um, in bad shape and then be invaded by undesirable weeds, invasive species, um, diseases are going to be more prevalent. So certainly the idea of no mow may has some merit. Mow higher and less frequently, but don't go an entire month without mowing your lawn. So there is a little basis of truth in all that stuff on the internet, but as Rock said, keep your mowing height higher, mow less. You know, there are plenty of great turf tips and many other topics to explore on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. Search for those answers from over 10 years of features or even some of our past shows. We do hope you'll check out our great videos we produced for the YouTube channel. After you watch tonight, do not forget to hit subscribe so you won't miss out on any of our new content. And we have a whole bunch of announcements, so I'm going to fly through these. The first is the 29th Annual Plant Fair and Market, Northeast Nebraska Master Gardeners, Friday and Saturday of this weekend. Then we have, of course, the Hort Club Sale, which is uh, UNL's bedding plant sale, May 4th and 5th and 6th, right here on East Campus. We have the Men's Garden Club of Omaha. Their annual plant sale is May 5th and 6th also. That's a great event. We have the Herbal Society, the Nebraska Herbal Society's 21st Annual Plant and Bake Sale here in Lincoln. And then we have the May Museum's 24th Annual Perennial Plant Sale, and that's in Fremont. So lots and lots of cool plant stuff going on. All right, we have several questions to get through. Kate, your very first one here is a Lincoln viewer who was moving a first-year mulch pile to a second-year pile and found these in the pile. What are they? Yeah, so these are white grubs, but because they were found in mulch and kind of what they look like, they seem like they might be hermit flower scarab beetle larvae, which are different than the white grubs that we know um, destroy or eat turf. So if you don't have any turf problems, they're just kind of cool and just let them be. Scarab beetle, all right, beetle. very yeah. cool. All right, you have um, two pictures on this one. This is an Omaha viewer. They're wondering, wondering what is the cause of a loss of bark on this red bud. It does have a south and east exposure and you got this because it's got little holes in it. Yeah, and you can see the tunnels under that bark too. Mm -hmm. So tis the season for borers this week. Um, these are going to be one of the red bud borers. We get a couple here in Nebraska. Um, you'll want to treat the tree. There are sprays, just be sure to choose one that treats borers. And you can apply that directly to the trunk up until about August. And depending on what type of red bud borer it is, you could also use um, a systemic treatment as well, because that'll take care of the, the flat headed ones. All right, that'll be too bad if they hit campus, Jeff. We have so many. <laughs> and your, th your, your last one here, of course, is uh, our lovely Chinese manted cases, but the question is different. He knows this is not our native and wants to know how to get rid of them. So this is apparently a very controversial topic, especially in the entomology world. Um, they are not native, they are general predators, but I'm of the opinion that you can just let them do their thing. If you want to destroy them, you're more than welcome to, but All right. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kate. Okay, uh, let's see, Rock, your first question here. This is uh, two, two pictures. This is a Fort Calhoun viewer, 40-year uh, viewer, which is great, acreage. And um, she thought maybe this was nutsedge. She's wondering how to control it. We know it's not. We know what it is. How does she, con what is it and how does she control it? It's wild onion as opposed to wild garlic, but still it's gonna have a strong odor to it, especially if you clip it. You can see the nutlets down there. Yellow nutsedge tubers are not that big, but at the end of the day, it's very difficult to control. You get marginal control with 2,4-D paste products, but as close as that was to the house and the other ornamentals, I'd struggle with that. Um, they can be dug, but if you leave any portion of the tuber behind or the onion behind, um, it's going to be coming back. So it's going to be persistence and hand pulling because I would not suggest they put a herbicide that close to the house. And the beauty of it is nothing will eat it and the pollinators love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, you have one picture on this one. This is a Washington County viewer and simple question. Should a professional replace this lawn? Yes. Okay, <laughs> and your, your next one here, uh, this is an interesting one. He's got this steep inclined hill. He wants to do something to make the front hill less of an eye eyesore. Is there any turf that would work or what do you think here? It's pretty steep. 
it's pretty steep, and that's why I think they have vetch there. It's you know it's common mm -hmm. vetch or hairy vetch. I'm not sure which one. Um, and it flowers purple. It's a woody species, next to impossible to control. And any work you do on that steep a slope, because you can tell from that steps going up, it's extremely steep, is going to be problematic, and they're going to have erosion problems. So try to clean up that bed somewhat with you know some of the less desirable ones. But if they don't like the vetch, then they've got a huge job ahead of them, and they need to get a hold of us and we can give them a eradication method. But I would leave the vetch. Um, I think they mentioned it had been cut down so it should branch back out and flower really pretty again. I, for, for slopes on the highways, you see it all the time. It's a great, it's a great selection. So I, I, would, I don't think this is an eyesore to me, but that's just me. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see, Kyle, you have, uh, you have two pictures on this first one. This is a hibiscus that he puts on the deck in the summer and doesn't like being inside in the winter. And then it's doing this. He does not think it's being overwatered. I would wonder about lack of light. Um, so one uh, hibiscus, the leaves can turn yellow if they're not getting quite enough light. Um, could be a Venturia um, fungus as well, but I, I think it's more environmental. All right, so maybe change the light and hope yeah, it warms move up. Move it around and you have hope it warms up. All right, uh, two pictures on this next one. This comes to us from an O'Neill viewer. Branch is cut last year by a power company, started dripping liquid and then flies were attracted to the liquid. And then they did try to cover it with a waterproof silicone. Oh, <laughs> and uh, what, what is happening with this and, and what would we recommend? Uh, we would recommend going back in time and not covering that wound. Um, and so it's, we're seeing just some, there's a slime flux or, or bacterial wet wood that's, and it's just kind of weeping out of that, out of that wound. Um, flies are attracted to it because it is, often can be pretty stinky. But seeing that weeping is not a, is not a negative, is it's not hurting the tree. Um, but what can ha hurt the tree is when you cover up those wounds, especially with some sort of sealant like that, you're now trapping the moisture in there and a lot of other fungi, bacteria, you now have a prime environment for those to spawn and cause a lot more issues in the future. All right, thank you, Kyle. Jeff, uh, your first two questions here, this is, a uh, actually an ornamental plum, probably Sistina, one of those. Mm -hmm. right. Planted it about 12 years ago, got bigger and bigger, and she'd cut it back. Now she's just afraid she's cut way too much off, got all these little leggy branches. Should she just be patient, or should she cut it all down again, or take it out and start over? Uh, she could prune, kind of head back the branches if she wants to give it a chance, but 12 years for a purple leaf sand cherry is pretty good, so. I would say maybe start over and you'd be happier. All right, uh, and then you have two pictures on this one and I know we talked back and forth yeah. on this. This is a Lincoln viewer. This particular branch fell off uh, this birch and it was dead and they're, they're wondering what caused these odd looking scars. So it's not a very big branch and apparently just one fell like this. What do you think? Yeah, I don't know. We we talked about this um, before the show, and it's very odd. They're they're so uniform through that that I don't know. It doesn't seem like an insect would do that, but so if it was a twig girdler, which I know you did talk about, what would you have expected instead? So usually the twig girdlers will just make like a clean cut around it. So if you suspect it's a twig girdler and send us a picture of like where it detached from the tree, we could probably take a look, but we usually don't see the many unsuccessful cuts like mm -hmm. that. So uniform, as right. Jeff said. So. Right, it's really strange. Yeah. Right. And fun. <laughs> strange. On the, on the one with the wet wood, yeah, I would just take another slice off of that. Uh, there's still enough room on that branch to um, to take that off and see if we could get that that heal to mm -hmm. get that cut to heal. The one thing. Yeah. All right. Good. Kate, we have about 30 seconds. I want you to comment just on this. This sure. is a Japanese be beetle thing that somebody said that what they have done is they mix 70% alcohol, a teaspoon of Dawn soap, a cup of corn oil, and a quart of water. Shake it up, spray it directly on them, and they just go. <laughs> what does that sound like to you? It sounds like it killed the beetle. It's probably not very practical, and it's not like rooted in research as far as I know, 
but it'd probably have the same effectiveness as if you just grabbed them and threw them in soapy water. So it's either the soap or the alcohol? Yeah, or... it could be a combination of both. Soap drowns them, alcohol kills them. So. <laughs>